My father beat me for years and tried to destroy my life. So when he showed up begging for forgiveness, I shut the door in his face and walked away. I've never written something like this before but I feel like I need to get it all out. I've read enough posts on here to know this isn't the most unusual story in the world, but it's mine, and I've been carrying it around for way too long. I don't even know what I'm looking for. Maybe just a way to make sense of the chaos. Anyway here goes. I guess I should start with the beginning which is always the hardest part to admit. I grew up in a small, suffocating town in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't much to look at except miles of open fields and cracked roads that felt like they were leading to nowhere. My parents, let's just call them Jill and Mark, were the kind of people who shouldn't have had kids. I didn't realize it then but now looking back it's all too obvious. From the outside, everything seemed picture perfect. Dad had a decent job at the local factory, and mom was one of those women who spent way too much time keeping up appearances, always telling me to smile more, stand up straight and make sure I didn't embarrass her. But behind closed doors, it was a whole different story. Mom was the puppet master, controlling every move, every decision, and every thought. I couldn't breathe without her telling me I was doing it wrong. The abuse wasn't always physical though there were moments like the time I dropped a glass at dinner, and she slapped me so hard I saw stars. But it was mostly mental, psychological. The way she would cut me down with her words, make me feel like I was worthless. She had this way of looking at me like I was nothing like I was this embarrassing, broken thing that she didn't know how to fix. I think the worst part was how good she was at making everything seem normal to everyone else. She wore her perfect mother mask so well that no one could ever suspect what was happening. Dad was no better. He wasn't abusive in the traditional sense, but he was absent in all the ways that mattered. He'd sit in his chair after work, nursing a beer and staring blankly at the TV, while I stood in the kitchen, listening to mom rant about how I wasn't good enough. I could never live up to her expectations. My grades weren't high enough, I wasn't social enough, I didn't play sports like the other boys. She'd tell me I was too soft, too weak and that no girl would ever want to be with me. I started believing it after a while. I mean if your own mother doesn't love you, who will? The house was a minefield. I never knew what would set her off. One day it was the fact that I didn't clean my room properly, and another day it was because I gotta be on a math test. She was obsessed with perfection, and I was her biggest disappointment. I think that's what she hated most about me, that I wasn't the golden child she could parade around like a trophy. Instead, I was this awkward, shy kid who just wanted to disappear. I started counting the days until I could get out but every time I thought about running, something held me back. Maybe it was fear. Maybe it was the fact that no matter how awful they were, they were still my parents. School wasn't much better. It was a small town high school where everyone knew each other, and if you didn't fit into one of the pre-assigned boxes, you were as good as invisible. Or worse, a target. I was the latter. I didn't have the confidence to stand up for myself so I became the kid everyone picked on. If I wasn't being shoved into lockers I was being laughed at in the cafeteria. Teachers didn't notice or if they did they didn't care. I was just another awkward kid who didn't belong anywhere. I was invisible at home and I was invisible at school. It felt like I was fading away bit by bit and no one would even notice if I disappeared completely. The only thing that kept me going was the thought of escaping. I knew I had to get out of that town. I had to get away from my parents, from everything that reminded me of them. So I buried myself in my studies. It was the only thing I had control over. I figured if I could get good enough grades, maybe I could get into a decent college and finally get away. I worked my ass off, staying up late at night, poring over textbooks, ignoring the sounds of mom yelling at dad downstairs. It was my ticket out and I wasn't going to let anything stop me. I got into a state university which was my first real victory. It was hours away from home and that's all I cared about. I remember the day I left for college. Mom tried to act like she was proud like she had anything to do with my success, but I could see it in her eyes. She didn't want me to leave. She wanted to keep me under her control like some twisted puppet she could manipulate. But I didn't care. I packed my things, said a quick goodbye and drove away without looking back. College was my chance to start over and I did my best to reinvent myself. I made friends, got involved in clubs and tried to be the person I always wanted to be. But the scars from my childhood didn't disappear just because I left home. They followed me everywhere. I still had that voice in my head, mom's voice, telling me I wasn't good enough, that I was going to fail, that I didn't deserve any of the good things happening to me. It was like she was still controlling me even from miles away. Things took a turn for the worse after I graduated. I thought getting my degree would be the final nail in the coffin of my old life, but instead, it just made everything more complicated. I couldn't find a job right away and the pressure started building. I didn't want to go back home but my savings were running out and I was desperate. That's when I made the decision to disappear. I packed up my car, withdrew what little money I had left and drove until I couldn't drive anymore. I ended up in a small town in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't exactly what I had planned, but it felt like a safe place to start over. I got a job at a diner working long hours for crap pay, but it was enough to keep me afloat. I didn't tell anyone where I was going, not even my friends from college. I just cut ties and vanished. I was terrified that if I stayed in contact with anyone my parents would find me and I couldn't risk that. I had to break free. For the first time in my life I felt a strange sense of peace. I wasn't constantly looking over my shoulder, waiting for someone to yell at me or tear me down. I could breathe even if it was just in the quiet moments between shifts at the diner. I rented a small apartment above an old bookstore and the owner, an older guy named Hank, was one of the few people I trusted. He didn't ask too many questions and I didn't offer too many answers. 
It was a quiet existence but after everything I'd been through, that was exactly what I needed. But of course it didn't last. One day I came home to find a letter slipped under my door. There was no return address, just my name scribbled in mom's familiar handwriting. My heart sank. I hadn't told anyone where I was and yet somehow she had found me. I didn't open the letter at first. I just stared at it, feeling the walls close in around me. All the progress I thought I had made, all the distance I had put between myself and my past, felt like it was crumbling away. I eventually opened the letter. It was short, just a few sentences but it was enough to send me spiraling. She said she knew where I was and she wanted me to come home. She made it sound like it was an invitation but I knew better. It was a command. She was reeling me back in like she always had and I didn't know how to stop it. I didn't respond to the letter but I started noticing little things, like the feeling of being watched when I walked home from work, or the way my phone would ring with a number I didn't recognize, only for the caller to hang up as soon as I answered. It was like she had her claws in me again even from a distance. I'm still in that town now still trying to figure out how to move forward. I thought running away would be enough, but I'm starting to realize that no matter how far I go, the shadows of my past are always going to follow me, and I don't know what to do about it. Hey Reddit I'm back again. I didn't expect so many of you to respond to my first post, and I'm grateful for everyone who reached out. It feels weird putting all this stuff out there for strangers to see, but honestly, it's been helping me process everything. I didn't think I'd write again so soon, but a lot has happened since I last posted, and I guess I need to get it off my chest. After receiving that letter from my mom I was a mess for a while. It was like everything I had built for myself since running away was crumbling down, and I didn't know how to deal with it. I was terrified that my past would find me again, that I'd get pulled back into the same toxic cycle I had barely escaped. But something inside me snapped. I realized I couldn't keep running forever, living in fear of them, of what they could do. So, I made a choice. I wasn't going to let them control my life anymore. I had worked too hard to get away from all that and I wasn't about to throw it all away. The first thing I did was quit my job at the diner. It wasn't that I hated it. It had helped me survive for a while but I knew I couldn't keep hiding there. I had a degree after all and I figured it was about time I started using it. I wasn't sure where to begin so I did what any clueless 20-something would do. I scoured job boards online and applied to everything remotely related to graphic design. It didn't matter if I had no experience. I was determined to break into the field and I knew that I had the skills to back it up. After what felt like an eternity of sending out resumes and getting rejection emails, I finally got a call back from a small design firm in a nearby city. They needed a junior designer to help with some basic projects, and while it wasn't exactly my dream job, it was a start. I still remember the nervous energy coursing through me as I walked into that office for my first day. The company was called Creative Minds, a small but growing agency run by this intense, no-nonsense woman named Diane. Diane was the kind of boss who didn't tolerate excuses, and I quickly realized that she wasn't interested in handholding. She threw me into the deep end and honestly it was terrifying. But looking back I think it's what I needed. I worked long hours learning the ins and outs of the industry. At first I made tons of mistakes. I messed up some client presentations, got the wrong colors and designs, and even accidentally sent a draft that wasn't finished to a major client. That one was a nightmare to fix. But each time I screwed up I learned something new. Diane wasn't one to coddle, but she saw potential in me. She'd make sarcastic remarks about my mistakes, but underneath it all, I think she respected the fact that I never gave up. Within a year, I wasn't just a junior designer anymore. I had learned the ropes fast and I was leading my own small projects. My confidence grew and so did my portfolio. Diane began assigning me to bigger clients, and before I knew it, I was working with names I'd only dreamed of when I first started out. The work was exhausting sure but it was exhilarating too. I was creating, building something out of nothing and I loved every minute of it. Things took an unexpected turn about two years in. I was called into Diane's office one morning, and she looked more serious than usual. I thought I had screwed something up again, but instead, she handed me a folder and told me to sit down. Inside the folder was an offer for a promotion, creative lead. Apparently, the senior designer who had been in that role was leaving to start her own agency, and Diane wanted me to take over. I was stunned. I had never imagined I'd rise so quickly, but there it was, right in front of me. My chance to take on a leadership role and shape the direction of the company's creative work. I took the promotion, obviously, and with it came more responsibility than I'd ever imagined. Suddenly, I wasn't just designing anymore. I was managing a team, overseeing projects from start to finish, and dealing directly with clients. It was overwhelming at first but I thrived under the pressure. I think all those years of walking on eggshells around my parents had prepared me for high-stress environments in a weird way. Nothing Diane or any client could throw at me was worse than the fear I used to live with every day. With the promotion came a substantial raise. For the first time in my life I wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. I started thinking about my future, about what I wanted out of life beyond just surviving. I had been living in a tiny one-bedroom apartment above that old bookstore, and while it had served its purpose, I was ready for something more permanent, something that felt like a real home. That's when I started looking for houses. I didn't have any grand plans really, but I figured it couldn't hurt to see what was out there. After a few weeks of browsing listings online I found it. A three-story house on the outskirts of the city, priced at $170,000. It was a bit run down but I could see the potential. It had big windows that let in a ton of natural light, a spacious backyard and enough room for me to grow into. I toured the place, fell in love with it and within a few months, it was mine. 
Moving into that house felt like the start of a new chapter. I had come so far from the scared, broken kid I used to be, and now I had something to show for it, a place that was mine that I had earned. I spent weeks fixing it up, painting the walls, furnishing the rooms and turning it into a space that felt like me. I even started doing some freelance design work on the side, using one of the rooms as a home office. Life was finally starting to feel stable. Of course, it wasn't long before things got complicated again. About a year into my new role as creative lead, the company took on a massive client, a tech company that was launching a new product and needed a full rebranding. It was the kind of project that could make or break us, and Diane made it clear that the pressure was on. I put everything into it, staying late nights, managing my team's workload, and constantly meeting with the clients to make sure everything was perfect. The stress was insane but I was determined to prove myself. Things seemed to be going well until one of the junior designers on my team, a guy named Tyler, started acting strangely. He was quiet, withdrawn, and missing deadlines left and right. I didn't think much of it at first. Everyone was under a lot of pressure but then I started noticing other things. He'd come in late, looking disheveled, and once I caught him in the bathroom, sweating and jittery like he was on something. I knew I couldn't ignore it any longer. One evening, after everyone had left, I asked him to stay behind for a chat. At first, he tried to brush me off, saying he was just tired and overworked, but I could see through the excuses. Eventually, he broke down and admitted he had a drug problem. He'd been using stimulants to keep up with the workload, but it had spiraled out of control. I was shocked. Tyler was one of the most talented designers on my team, and I hadn't seen this coming at all. I didn't know what to do. Part of me wanted to fire him on the spot, but another part of me remembered what it was like to feel trapped, to feel like you had no way out. I talked to Diane about it and we agreed to give him one last chance. We offered him support, connected him with a counselor, and reduced his workload so he could focus on getting clean. It wasn't an easy decision and it wasn't without risk, but I couldn't bring myself to just throw him away. The project continued but the stress was starting to take a toll on me too. I was managing everything Tyler's situation, the client's demands and my own expectations, and it was starting to wear me down. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, heart racing, unable to fall back asleep because my mind wouldn't stop spinning. I'd lie there, staring at the ceiling, wondering if I was in over my head. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any more complicated, I got another letter from my mother. This one wasn't like the last one. There was no subtle manipulation, no pretending to care. This letter was full of rage. She wrote about how I had abandoned them, how I was an ungrateful son, how they had sacrificed everything for me, and I had repaid them by running away. She accused me of being selfish, of thinking I was too good for them, and she even threatened to come find me if I didn't come home and make things right. Reading that letter brought back all the old fears, all the old anger. I hadn't spoken to my parents in years and I had no intention of starting now, but the threat of them showing up at my doorstep, of them invading this new life I had built for myself, sent me into a tailspin. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want them to have any power over me, but the thought of confronting them terrified me. So, I did what I had always done. I buried myself in my work. I threw myself into the project, working late nights, pushing my team harder than ever, and trying to drown out the noise in my head. But no matter how hard I worked, no matter how much I tried to focus, the fear lingered, gnawing at me from the inside. The rebranding project was finally completed, and the client was thrilled. It was a huge success for the company, and Diane even pulled me aside to tell me how impressed she was with how I had handled everything. But instead of feeling proud, I felt empty. I had pushed myself to the brink, sacrificed my own well-being, and for what? To prove that I was good enough? To prove that I wasn't the scared kid my mother had always said I was? The victory felt hollow. I had spent so long running from my past, trying to build a life that was separate from everything I had come from, but I was starting to realize that no matter how far I ran, it would always be there, lurking in the background. I don't know what my next move is. I've built a career, a life, a home, but the shadows of my past are still there, and I'm starting to wonder if I'll ever truly escape them. Thanks for listening, Reddit. I don't have all the answers yet, but maybe writing it all out will help me figure out what to do next. Hey Reddit. It's been a while. I've got a lot to update you on, and honestly, I still can't believe everything that's happened. After my last post, things spiraled in ways I never expected, and I feel like I've been living in a nightmare. But I guess I should just start from the beginning. It had been about a year since I bought my house, and life was finally starting to feel stable again. Work was going well. After the massive rebranding project, I had earned a reputation in the design industry, and I was getting offers to work on projects I could have only dreamed about a few years ago. My team respected me, Diane was pleased with my performance and the company was thriving. I had even taken up some freelance work which kept me busy and helped pad my savings. I thought I was finally in control of my life. But, of course nothing stays perfect for long. One afternoon, I was sitting in my office at home, working on some concept designs for a new client, when I heard a knock at the door. I wasn't expecting anyone but I figured it might be a delivery or one of the neighbors. My house was in a quiet part of town so I didn't get many visitors. I opened the door without thinking twice, and my heart nearly stopped when I saw who was standing there. It was my mother. I hadn't seen her in years not since I left home after college. She looked older, more haggard than I remembered, but her eyes still had that same cold, controlling glint that used to terrify me as a kid. For a second I just stood there, frozen, unsure of what to do. Part of me wanted to slam the door in her face and pretend she had never shown up, but the other part, the part of me that still feared her, kept me rooted to the spot. Are you going to invite me in or are you going to stand there like an idiot? 
She snapped, pushing past me without waiting for an answer. I followed her inside, my stomach churning. My house, the place I had worked so hard to make my own, suddenly felt suffocating with her presence. She walked through the living room, eyeing everything with a look of disdain, as if she were judging every choice I had made, every piece of furniture I had picked out. So, this is where you've been hiding, she said, her voice dripping with contempt. I expected something more impressive. I didn't respond. I didn't know what to say. My mind was racing, trying to figure out why she was here, what she wanted. I hadn't heard from her since the last letter she sent, the one where she threatened to come find me. I thought she had given up after I didn't respond, but clearly, I had underestimated her. She turned to face me, arms crossed, a smug smile playing on her lips. I'm not going to waste any time, so let's get straight to the point. You owe me. I blinked, confused. Will you? For what? For everything she said, her voice sharp. For raising you, for putting up with your ungrateful behavior, for all the sacrifices your father and I made for you. And now, after all we've done, you run off by yourself a house and act like we don't exist? Like we're nothing to you? I could feel my hands shaking but I clenched them into fists trying to stay calm. I don't owe you anything I said, my voice quieter than I wanted it to be. I worked for this. I built this life for myself. You don't get to take that away from me. Her smile widened but it wasn't a pleasant one. It was the smile of someone who knew they had you cornered. Oh but I can. And I will. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to give me this house, every cent of the $170,000 it's worth, and in exchange I'll forgive you for abandoning us. It's the least you can do considering everything we've done for you. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. The sheer audacity of her demand was staggering. You want me to give you my house? I asked incredulous. You can't be serious. I'm dead serious she said her voice ice cold. This house or I'll make your life a living hell. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My own mother, standing in my home, demanding that I give her everything I had worked for, as if it were her right to take it from me. The anger that had been simmering beneath the surface for years finally boiled over. I had spent my entire life bending to her will, letting her control me, manipulate me but not anymore. Not this time. No, I said firmly, my voice stronger than I expected. You're not getting my house. You're not getting anything from me. You've taken enough, her face twisted with fury and for a moment, I thought she might actually hit me. But instead she sneered, you'll regret this. I'll make sure of it. And with that, she turned and stormed out of the house, slamming the door behind her. I stood there for a long time, trying to process what had just happened. I thought that would be the end of it, that she would go back to whatever hole she had crawled out of and leave me alone. But, as always, I underestimated just how far my mother was willing to go to get what she wanted. A few weeks later, I received a summons in the mail. My mother was suing me. She was claiming that I had somehow defrauded her, that the money I had used to buy my house was rightfully hers, and that she was entitled to it. The lawsuit was absurd but the fact that she had actually gone through with it shook me to my core. I couldn't believe that my own mother was willing to drag me into court over something so ridiculous. I immediately contacted a lawyer, a woman named Karen who came highly recommended by a friend. Karen was a no-nonsense type, sharp and direct, and after I explained the situation she didn't mince words. Your mother doesn't have a leg to stand on, she said, flipping through the papers my mother's lawyer had filed. This is a blatant cash grab, plain and simple. We'll fight it and we'll win. I wanted to believe her, but part of me couldn't shake the fear that my mother would somehow find a way to ruin me. She had always been good at getting what she wanted, and the thought of facing her in court terrified me. The legal battle that followed was the most exhausting and emotionally draining experience of my life. My mother's lawyer, a sleazy guy named Bob McCarthy, made it clear from the start that they weren't interested in settling. They wanted to drag this out to make me suffer and they succeeded. Every time I thought we were making progress, they would throw another ridiculous claim into the mix, forcing us to spend more time and money fighting it. My mother played the victim card at every opportunity, claiming that I had manipulated her, that I had taken advantage of her kindness, and that she was just a poor old woman trying to get back what was rightfully hers. It was infuriating and there were times when I felt like I was losing my mind, but Karen kept me grounded. She was relentless, tearing apart every argument they made and exposing the lies for what they were. The trial itself was a circus. My mother took the stand, sobbing about how I had abandoned her, how I had tricked her into giving me money which never happened by the way and how she was just trying to get justice. I sat there, listening to her spin this web of lies, feeling like I was trapped in some kind of nightmare. It was surreal, watching the woman who had tormented me my entire life now trying to destroy me in front of a courtroom full of strangers. But the worst part came when they called my father to the stand. I hadn't seen him in even longer than I hadn't seen my mother, and when he walked into that courtroom, it felt like all the air had been sucked out of the room. He looked older, weaker than I remembered, and for a brief moment, I felt a pang of sympathy for him, but then he opened his mouth and all that sympathy disappeared. He testified that I had always been a problem child, that I had never appreciated what they had done for me, and that I had been running wild ever since I left home. He claimed that they had supported me financially through college, another lie, and that I owed them for everything I had. It was like watching a stranger. This man who had been so absent in my life was now standing there, twisting the knife my mother had already driven into my back. But Karen was ready. When it was her turn to cross-examine my father, she dismantled his testimony piece by piece. She presented bank statements, emails and other evidence that completely contradicted everything he had said. By the time she was done, it was clear to everyone in that courtroom that my parents were nothing more than opportunistic liars, 
trying to extort their own son. The trial dragged on for weeks and there were times when I didn't think I could take it anymore. The stress was unbearable and I started having panic attacks, something that hadn't happened to me in years. I couldn't sleep, couldn't focus on work and I was constantly on edge waiting for the next blow to land. But through it all, I held on to one thought. I wasn't going to let them win. Not this time. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the verdict came in. I won. The judge ruled in my favor, dismissing all of my mother's claims as baseless and ordering her to pay my legal fees. It was a victory but it didn't feel like one. I was exhausted, emotionally drained, and while I was relieved that the nightmare was finally over, I couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal. My own parents had tried to ruin me to take everything I had worked for and for what? Money? Control? I would never understand their motives and I knew I would never get any closure from them. After the trial, my mother disappeared again. She went back to wherever she had been living, and I haven't heard from her since. Part of me is still waiting for the other shoe to drop, for her to try something else, but for now it seems like she's finally given up. As for me I'm trying to move on. It's not easy and there are days when the weight of everything still feels like too much to bear. But I'm taking it one step at a time, trying to focus on the life I've built for myself, the life they tried to take from me. I don't know what the future holds but I do know one thing. I won't let them control me ever again. Hey Reddit, I never thought I'd be writing here again. But life has a way of throwing you curveballs and right now I'm trying to process everything that's happened. If you've read my previous posts, you know that things with my family have always been complicated, to say the least. But after the trial with my mother I thought it was finally over. I thought I could move on. I couldn't have been more wrong. I guess I should just dive in and tell you what happened. A few months after I won the lawsuit against my mother, life started to feel normal again. I had finally put the nightmare behind me and was trying to focus on work and just live a quiet life. I didn't expect to hear from my parents again, and honestly, I wasn't thinking about them anymore. I had my own life to live, and I was doing everything I could to move forward. But then one night everything changed. It was a Friday evening and I had just finished a long week at work. I remember it so clearly because I had been looking forward to the weekend. I had plans to meet up with a few friends maybe grab a drink and just unwind. I was sitting in my living room watching TV when I heard a loud knock at the door. At first, I thought it was just one of my neighbors maybe asking for something. But as soon as I opened the door my stomach dropped. It was my father. He stood there, glaring at me with this look of pure rage on his face. I hadn't seen him since the trial, and I hadn't expected to see him again, especially not like this. He looked rough, disheveled like he hadn't slept in days, his clothes wrinkled and dirty. His eyes were wild, filled with an anger I hadn't seen before. Before I could even get a word out he pushed his way inside. He was yelling something about how I had disrespected my mother, how I had ruined the family by suing her and winning the case. He kept saying that I had no right to take what was theirs, and that I had humiliated them. His words were coming out so fast and slurred that I could barely understand him, but I could feel the tension in the air, the danger. I tried to calm him down to tell him to leave but he wasn't listening. His rage was so intense that I knew this wasn't just going to be a heated conversation. He was out for blood. Before I knew what was happening, he lunged at me, his fist connected with the side of my face, sending me sprawling backward. I hit the floor hard and for a moment I was dazed trying to make sense of what was happening. But before I could even get up he was on me fist flying. I tried to defend myself but he was relentless. It was like all the years of pent up anger and resentment he had harbored were finally being unleashed. I remember the pain. Sharp, brutal, overwhelming. His fists landed blow after blow and I could feel my ribs cracking, my face swelling, the taste of blood filling my mouth. I was no match for him. He was bigger, stronger and completely out of control. I don't know how long the attack lasted. It felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only a few minutes before my neighbors hearing the commotion called the police. By the time they arrived I was barely conscious. My father was still yelling, standing over me like he was ready to finish the job. The police had to physically drag him off me and even then he was fighting, screaming that I had betrayed them, that I deserved what was coming to me. The last thing I remember before blacking out was the flashing red and blue lights, and the sound of handcuffs clicking around his wrists. I woke up in the hospital, my entire body aching like I had been hit by a truck. My vision was blurry and it took me a few moments to even register where I was. I tried to move but pain shot through my chest and arms and I groaned involuntarily. A nurse appeared by my side, her expression sympathetic but professional. You're lucky to be alive, she said, adjusting the forge rip attached to my arm. You've got multiple fractures, your ribs, your arm and you've got some pretty severe facial injuries but you're stable now. You're going to be okay. I wanted to ask her what had happened, but the memories came flooding back before I could even form the words. My father. The attack. The police. I tried to sit up but the pain was too much. The nurse gently pushed me back down. You need to rest, she said. You're not going anywhere for a while. Over the next few days, the full extent of my injuries became clear. I had three broken ribs, a fractured left arm, a concussion, and numerous cuts and bruises all over my face and body. The doctors told me I would need weeks, maybe months, of physical therapy to fully recover, but the worst part wasn't the physical pain. It was the emotional toll. My own father had done this to me and I couldn't wrap my head around it. The police came to the hospital to take my statement. They told me that my father had been arrested on charges of assault and battery, and that he was being held in custody pending trial. They also informed me that he had a history of violent behavior that I hadn't known about. Apparently, after I left home, 
things had gotten worse between him and my mother, and there had been several incidents of domestic violence that had never been reported. I was in shock. I had always known that my father was a cold, distant man, but I had never imagined that he was capable of something like this. The fact that he had been violent toward my mother after I left only added another layer of guilt to the mess I was already feeling. The days in the hospital dragged on. I was in and out of surgery to repair the damage to my arm and ribs, and the pain was constant. The doctors gave me painkillers but nothing seemed to dull the emotional ache. I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened, about how my life had gone from bad to worse in a matter of minutes. I had thought I was finally free of my parents, but now, it felt like they had pulled me back into their toxic world, and I didn't know how to escape. The trial came faster than I expected. My father, now a man I barely recognized, was facing serious jail time for what he had done to me. The prosecutor, a sharp, determined woman named Rachel Matthews, was relentless in her pursuit of justice. She painted a clear picture of a man consumed by anger and jealousy, a man who had allowed his own bitterness to drive him to violence. My lawyer Karen was with me every step of the way. She had handled my mother's case and now she was determined to see this one through as well. She had become more than just my lawyer. She was one of the few people I trusted completely. She knew my family's history, knew the damage they had done to me over the years, and she wasn't going to let my father get away with what he had done. The courtroom was tense during the trial. My father sat across from me, his eyes filled with hatred, and I couldn't help but wonder if he had always been like this, or if something had changed in him over the years. Either way, the man sitting there wasn't the father I had grown up with. He was a stranger, and I felt nothing but a deep, hollow sadness as I looked at him. The evidence was overwhelming. The police had photos of my injuries, medical records detailing the extent of the damage, and eyewitness testimony from my neighbors who had heard the attack and called 911. My father's defense attorney tried to argue that it was a moment of temporary insanity, that he had been pushed to the brink by the stress of the lawsuit and his crumbling relationship with my mother. But no one bought it. Not the jury, not the judge, and certainly not me. I had to take the stand and recount the attack in detail. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Standing there in front of a courtroom full of people, talking about how my own father had tried to beat me to death. But I did it. I told the truth, every painful detail and when I was done I felt a strange sense of relief. Like I was finally letting go of something that had been weighing me down for years. The trial lasted a few weeks and in the end the verdict was exactly what I had hoped for. My father was found guilty of assault and battery with intent to cause serious bodily harm. He was sentenced to several years in prison, and as I sat there in the courtroom watching him being led away in handcuffs, I felt empty. I thought I would feel a sense of but instead, there was just this deep, aching void. It's been a few months since the trial, and I'm still recovering physically and emotionally. The doctors say I'm making good progress, but I'm not sure when or if I'll ever fully heal from everything that's happened. The scars, both on my body and in my mind, are still there and I'm learning to live with them. I've started going to therapy which has been helping more than I expected. My therapist, a kind woman named Sarah, has helped me work through a lot of the anger and guilt I've been carrying around. She's helped me understand that what happened to me wasn't my fault, that I didn't deserve any of this, and that it's okay to feel the way I do. It's a slow process but I'm getting there. As for my father, I don't know if I'll ever see him again. Part of me hopes I never do. I've cut all ties with my parents, and I have no intention of ever going back to that part of my life. I'm focused on building something better for myself, something that isn't tied to the pain and trauma of my past. I don't know what the future holds but for the first time in a long time, I'm starting to feel hopeful. Hit that subscribe button now, or you'll be the one asking wait what did I miss, while everyone else is cracking up.